The name of the film uh, is The Nuns, The Priests, and The Bonds, and it tells a story which is all the more relevant in today's uh, age of degrading nuclear diplomacy, and I hope uh, that it speaks to you the way it spoke to me. And without further ado, um, I'll begin playing the film, after which there will be a panel discussion with our three guests and questions from the audience. So what we'll do is we'll have a few um, questions for our uh, speakers. Uh, I'll moderate a small discussion for a brief while, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. So Helen Young is an Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist who has forged a career as a filmmaker and writer by blending a passion for investigative reporting with a commitment to illuminating critical issues of the day. Over the course of an esteemed career, Helen has directed and produced documentary films on subjects ranging from the childhood obesity crisis in America and illegal gun trafficking to the U.S. space program. She has won a National News Emmy Award and three New York Emmys for her work, as well as awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, United Press International, the National Commission on Working Women, and the Red Cross. She is currently a contributor to the Huffington Post. Frida Berrigan, who's also with us, is a writer, activist, and mother whose work has appeared in The Nation, Waging Nonviolence, and Tom Dispatch. She is the daughter of Philip Berrigan and Elizabeth McAllister, a former priest and nun whose lifelong peace activism has made them central to the American anti-war movement. Frida's book, It Runs in the Family, on being raised by radicals and growing into rebellious motherhood, details growing up with her activist parents and her own experiences becoming a mother in a violent world. Frida lives in New London, Connecticut, with her husband Patrick and their three children. Alex Nunes is a journalist and producer for The Public's Radio, an NPR affiliate for Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts. He is well known for his coverage of Rhode Island's close alliance with Electric Boat, a general dynamic subsidiary and manufacturer of military and nuclear submarines. He is currently researching and interviewing sources for Mosaic, a 30-part podcast series on immigration to told through the individual stories of local immigrants and their descendants. Alex is based in Westerly, Rhode Island, and we're happy to have him back at Brown. Unfortunately, we're an anti-war group, so we're poor, and we can only afford uh, three table mics. So I'm going to sit over there and join Alex Nunes and hopefully not hog his mic too much. So, Helen, uh, I think it's appropriate to begin with you. So why don't you tell us about how you became involved with this type of work, uh, how you came to know these people, and could you please tell us where are the protagonists of this amazing story now? Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Brown University and Brown War Watch for inviting me here to show the film. Uh, a big thank you to Matt Ritchie, who was really the catalyst and driving force behind organizing this. Thank you also to Alex Nunes, who is an excellent journalist and has done some great work on uh, the connection between nuclear weapons manufacturers and government corporate welfare. It was actually Alex who told Brown War Watch about the film, so thank you, Alex. Um, I'd like to thank the Religious Studies Department and the Middle East Studies Department and also the um, Friends, the Providence Friends Meeting in Rhode Island who helped um, get the word out on the film. Finally, I, I would like to say that I feel especially honored to be here with Frida Berrigan, who is the daughter of Elizabeth McAllister and um, Phil Berrigan, two pioneers in the uh, American resistance to war, militarism, and nuclear weapons. Um, as you saw in the film, Dan and Phil Berrigan actually started the Plowshares Movement back in 1980, when uh, along with um, six other people, they trespassed onto a nuclear weapons um, manufacturing facility where the uh, nose cones for the Mark 12A warheads were being created. Uh, and tonight, even as we speak, Frida's mother, Elizabeth McAllister, is in a Georgia jail awaiting trial 
uh, for the most recent Plowshares action that occurred last year when uh, seven activists, among them Elizabeth McAllister, trespassed onto uh, the uh, Trident nuclear submarine base in Kings Bay, Georgia. And um, they are facing some very serious charges that could put them in prison for 25 years. So I just want to say that at, at the outset that having made this documentary, I just developed a tremendous uh, respect for the sacrifices, the personal sacrifices that these activists have made over uh, their lives. Uh, and I, I do feel that, um, in my opinion, we, we all owe them a debt of gratitude uh, for what they have done to try to wake us all up about this issue. Now, just getting to your question. Um, I worked, as you said, in, in the news business for many years. I was a producer and writer for CBS and NBC News and other um, news-related uh, organizations. And uh, I also have a background in international affairs and have been involved in the peace movement. Uh, I'd been interested in the issue of nuclear weapons for a long time, and, but the, the actual catalyst that got me going on moving forward on the idea was after I read an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, by the so-called four horsemen, um, George Shultz and Henry Kissinger, two former U.S. Secretaries of State, uh, William Perry, former Defense Secretary, and former Senator Sam Nunn. These four people had been very strong supporters of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. However, in this op-ed, they wrote that they had changed their minds about nuclear weapons, and they felt that we, that, that global security could best be safeguarded if we actually eliminated nuclear weapons. And I, I, was, I was stunned by this, by this article and uh, really curious to understand what had changed and why they had done a complete 180 in their opinion. And so that sent me on a, a journey to research this, this issue, which is very complicated and politically charged. Um, during the course of my research, most of the information that I came across focused on military, strategic, or geopolitical information. And I was looking to put a human face on this, um, on this issue and explore kind of the moral, legal, and ethical aspects of it. And I think that, that that's what the story of this film is about, so. Uh, Frida. As, uh, we've, as we've already mentioned, your family has a very important role in the history of uh, anti-war activism in the United States. It's difficult to summarize in a brief moment, but um, could you um, tell us, could you give us an update about this very serious situation in your family now and perhaps contextualize it in the longer history of the very important story of your family's work? Sure. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, Helen, it was so uh, lovely to reconnect uh, with so many people uh, through watching your film, um, uh, particularly with the spirit of Anne Montgomery and, and of, of Bill Bixell. And, and so I, I thank you for that. And thank you for bringing all of those people into this room, uh, particularly Steve Kelly and sort of the, the the postscript to the epilogue is that Steve Kelly, uh, too, is in uh, this county uh, detention facility in Brunswick, Georgia, the Glynn County Detention Facility, along with Mark Colville, who's a uh, Catholic worker from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and as Helen mentioned, uh, my mother, who celebrated her 79th birthday um, uh, there in, in November. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're talking about Bix, who's 84, and Sister Emma Montgomery, who's 82, and uh, Sister Megan, who's in her 80s as well. Uh, 79 doesn't seem uh, so old, you know. Um, but uh, it was hard to, uh, to celebrate another year of her life uh, separated um, in this very familiar and, uh, um, and uh, sad way. Uh, as Helen mentioned, uh, seven uh, activists. You saw every single one of them, I think, through the course of the film. Uh, Claire Grady, Carmen Trotta, 
Patrick O'Neill, um, Steve, uh, Liz, um, and then uh, Martha Hennessy and, um, and Mark Colville, uh, the seven entered uh, the Kings Bay uh, nuclear weapons facility uh, in Georgia, very similar to the, the facility in, in Bremerton uh, or Kitsap um, uh, that Susan and Lynn and the others uh, went into. And uh, I also kind of cut through fences and, and traveled through swamps and, uh, and uh, over unfamiliar terrain uh, to, uh, to reach some central location uh, on the base um, and to bring um, uh, the hammers and, and the blood um, and the banners and the message, um, uh, the need for transformation and disarmament um, uh, to, to that place. Um, and so they've been, uh, the three of them have been held ever since. Uh, the four others are out on bond. They're wearing the ankle monitors that you saw on Sister Anne's um, ankle. Uh, Father Steve Kelly was not offered bond because he was still um, under the charges for the action that, uh, that was covered in the film. Um, and then my mom said uh, she wasn't going to pay a bond um, and she wasn't going to be uh, monitored or sort of um, in, inhabit, you know, put the jail inside of her head instead of have it, you know, external uh, by, by allowing her movements to be um, curtailed and uh, scrutinized and, and regulated in the way that uh, they would have to be wearing the monitor. Um, and then Mark Colville uh, felt similarly, he was, had to uh, leave uh, jail sort of briefly and have a medical procedure done and then has, has returned. Um, they uh, still don't have a court date. Uh, the, um, the wheels of justice are, are moving particularly slowly uh, because in this case they have offered motions, uh, sort of an innovative legal defense strategy uh, whereby they're saying that their action uh, was a, a form of religious speech and, and thus is, is protected under the freedom of religion. Um, and this, is, as you all probably well know, uh, this uh, legal strategy has been used quite effectively by uh, corporations like the Hobby Lobby um, and uh, the cake maker uh, who refused to make the cake for the uh, gay couple's wedding. Um, and so they're sort of uh, trying to recast uh, this particular legal measure um, uh, to, um, to protect uh, symbolic nonviolent transformation of, of weapons of mass destruction into uh, agricultural implements. Um, we'll see uh, if that strategy takes hold. Um, as you saw in both of the um, trials uh, that uh, Helen's film covers, um, you know, you have to be very creative uh, within uh, U.S. courts in order to get any information about the larger context in which the, these actions are happening in, and that has been uh, the case since, uh, since 1980 in the first uh, Plowshares action, um, which was carried out, uh, as Helen said, by my father and uncle and then Ann Montgomery uh, and, and a number of other people. And so, um, so I ask that uh, all of you uh, uh, stay um, up to date uh, with the Kings Bay Plowshares. Um, they have a website. They're trying to be very media savvy. They have these little um, uh, flyers they want people to take pictures with and then uh, do the whole hashtag you know, kind of thing. Um, so I have a couple of those if, if you want to, um, to do that afterwards. And they have a website, kingsbayplowshare7.org. Um, and we're expecting that a, a trial would happen sometime in April um, uh, down in Georgia. Um, and so I think one of the, maybe just the last thing I'll say is that uh, they you know, didn't have a lot of uh, local support in Georgia, um, as we saw in, uh, in both in Tennessee and in Washington state, there was a, a vibrant local anti-nuclear community in, in both of those places that was able to kind of hold uh, these actions and, and, and provide support. Um, and one of the reasons that this group opted to act in Georgia is that there really wasn't um, a, a strong local anti-nuclear community, uh, and they hoped that their action would engender and sort of catalyze that. Um, and, uh, and so that is, that is unfolding um, uh, slowly 
It is a completely militarily dependent community, um, sort of like Rhode Island and, and Connecticut are dependent on electric boat. Uh, this area of Georgia is, is completely dependent both on the Navy uh, and then all of the corporations that, uh, that are, are there because the Navy is there. Um, so it is a, is a very difficult place uh, to be um, to be peace activists, uh, to be people of conscience, um, and yet that is, that is what each of them felt called to do. I think it goes without saying that uh, we all have nothing but admiration for your family, and we send our thoughts and best wishes to them, and, and uh, we'll transmit this material as best we can. Um, we've heard about Georgia now. We saw a story about uh, Washington and Tennessee, um, but you mentioned Rhode Island, and uh, Alex, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how Rhode Island and indeed southeastern New England is entangled in uh, in nuclear industry as well? Sure. Here, I can just hold sure. So um, the submarines that you saw in the film were built at General uh, Dynamics Electric Boat shipyards in Rhode Island and Connecticut. The uh, Navy is now planning on building an entirely new fleet um, with the construction starting in 2020 um, in Rhode Island and Connecticut um, that would replace the, the fleet that was in the, the film. Um, so Rhode Island and Connecticut play a pretty significant role um, in this. So. Um, so th this was uh, part of the reason why I initially contacted Helen about showing this film here. Um, I think of any place that should, where people should be learning about this, it would be in Rhode Island and Connecticut because we play such a, a crucial role in this. Um, I began looking into this, into this as a story to write about uh, about two years ago when in my town, Westerly, um, there is a facility open to train people to construct the submarines. And at the time, uh, the state of Rhode Island and Connecticut at the time were dedicating millions of dollars in subsidies to um, help hire and help train the people to build these submarines. Um, and that initially struck me as something that should be pursued more and, and investigated more, because at the time, people were really just writing about it in terms of how this is just so great for jobs in the area and a lot of people are going to be employed and all of that. Um, and I was looking at it, at that time I didn't really know too much about nuclear weapons and um, the types of submarines that historically have been built at Electric Boat. I was kind of more struck by the fact that people were so celebratory about giving away state money to a company that was already entirely funded by the federal government and federal tax dollars. It seemed um, kind of odd. So that was sort of the perspective I started looking at it from. And then um, as I dug into it more, I just saw how there was just so much more there that um, our federal officials are, are, you know, basically, I mean, people make the argument that they're in the, the pocket of um, General Dynamics and other military contractors. Um, so in Rhode Island, uh, our senior senator, Jack Reed, is on the Senate um, Armed Services Committee. He's the highest ranking Democrat. His, his um, largest campaign contributor over the course of his career has been General Dynamics. Um, Jim Langevin is the congressman for our second congressional district. Um, same thing with him. Joe Courtney is the um, uh, congressman for for Frida's uh, district, where the, the larger shipyard is, same thing for him. Um, so, so yeah, as, as, a, as a journalist, um, what I've noticed and what I wanted to kind of get across to, to readers or people who uh, see or hear my work is um, just this, just how how little scrutiny there goes into um, this issue from officials and um, how it's not really looked at critically. People aren't thinking, people aren't thinking or talking about publicly um, 
the need for the weapons. Um, they're not talking about the expense of the weapons. Um, the conversation is really sort of um, uh, narrow in terms of, in our area, just about the jobs related to it. And um, I think probably to the advantage of electric boat that it, it's framed that way. Uh, that's an interesting point. Helen, you've also worked in the mainstream press. What's your assessment of the, of the, the quality of coverage of this issue in the contemporary news media? Well, I would, I would have to say that I think it's pretty poor. I mean, I, I, I don't think that we're you know, really exploring the amount of money that we're spending on these weapons. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, it, toward the end of the film, uh, there was that section there where we talked about the United Nations and this new treaty that was um, adopted in 2017 by 122 countries. And so I had the um, good fortune to be able to sit in on some of the uh, the discussion that was going on at the, at the UN, and to hear country after country talk about um, the United States and the other nuclear-armed uh, nations telling them that, no, they can't have nuclear weapons, but we're going to be building our own, uh, the, the hypocrisy of it. And yet, you know, there's been very little written about this treaty, which, of course, you know, the nuclear-armed states are not involved in. Um, Simplistically, I mean, to answer your question, I, I don't think that the, the American public is very much engaged in this issue. Nuclear weapons are seen as what protect us, you know, what th this is what protects us. And in fact, um, there was an, an interesting uh, research uh, study done by one of the groups in trying to figure out why can't we get people energized about this. And, as, as part of the research, they showed that, in fact, some video games show children you know, shooting at each other with nuclear weapons. So the whole narrative of this issue is it's, it has to be changed. Um, and I guess I, I would give it a failing score in terms of mainstream media. The argument is that uh, it protects us and I think we are all skeptical of this argument, the nuclear arsenal. But an additional argument that um, Alex brought up is that it has certain economic benefits and that jobs are tied up in this industry. Alex, does that argument hold water? Um, and even if it does, how do you see, um, uh, for example, the Rhode Island economy actually practically disentangling itself in a in a just way from these, from these uh, industrial forces? Sure. So, I mean, they, they certainly do hire people. Um, Electric Boat is hiring thousands of people right now. Um, but the question would be, is that uh, what's best long term for the um, regional economy? Uh, people make the argument that um, military Jobs based on military contracts are a boom and bust. And if you look at employment at Electric Boat, um, it's just always been like a roller coaster up and down. Um, so a lot of economists who study this and are, are critical of it, they think that regions like ours should be moving in a direction where they diversify and invest in other areas and not get as reliant on... Um, a single employer who's dependent on uh, federal contracts. Um, at the same time, I, I do think that you know people who are in Washington, um, like Jack Reed or Joe Courtney or Jim Langevin, I think they see it as sort of like their their marching orders to go there and get contracts for um, for this area. So, it, in in terms of diversifying economy, it makes it difficult if that's um, their priority. Uh, I think you could also say that the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island are certain, certainly giving uh, up a lot of money in order to, to get these jobs. Um, 
last year, Connecticut said that it was going to dedicate $83 million in subsidies to help support infrastructure um, and job training at Electric Boat to get it ready to build um, the Columbia class, which is going to be the new class of submarines um, estimated at $128 billion right now to build them. Um, and I read a report from December that said that um, it, the Government Accountability Office now thinks that uh, the Navy is kind of underestimating the likelihood that it's going to run over $128 billion. And then in Rhode Island last year, around the same time that Connecticut dedicated $83 million, um, we said that we would pay up to $34 million to support uh, infrastructure and job training at, um, at Electric Boat, you know, in our state, in their shipyard here. Um, so, yeah, there, I mean, they definitely do create jobs and people work there. Um, it would just be the question of, you know, uh, at what expense, if is the money worth it, um, could the, um, could it be better used, could people be focusing in, in different areas more productively? In that sense, I, I guess it seems unlikely we can rely wholeheartedly on, um, on legislators for, for this type of change. And in that sense, we may have to resort to um, more uh, practical and tried methods. And with that, I'll, I'll turn to Frida and ask, um, first of all, how would you assess the current state of, generally, of anti-nuclear activism in this country? Mm -hmm. And and then, uh, what practically can people do? people in the audience even do to follow in the footsteps and follow the example of, of uh, these people we saw on the screen and uh, the people in your family as well. Well, I, I think that peace movement is being pulled in a thousand different directions and that, uh, that, that people are Maybe I'll just speak personally. I, I feel pulled in a thousand different directions. I, um, the, the image we use in our family uh, um, is from The Hobbit. And uh, it's, uh, I feel like uh, too little butter spread over too much bread, um, which I think is a very evocative image. Um, and and uh, I... I with regard to the nuclear issue in particular, I think that the way it's always been, if I can kind of piggyback or start there, it's always been uh, sort of presented to the American people as, uh, as something for the experts, right? That we really, as, as individuals, as American citizens, we really don't need to trouble ourselves with that. Um, and uh, there are so many acronyms and so many statistics and so much kind of jargon uh, surrounding nuclear weapons um, that's very hard to penetrate. Um, and, and so it, it, just sort of, it just sort of fades away. Um, and it is relegated to the shadows. Um, and, and as I was sitting watching the film and you know, seeing the, the, particularly the drawings from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I had this like, oh, Madeline turned to me and she said, gonna have nightmares tonight mommy and I thought shoot oh yeah she sure is and I spent my childhood having nightmares uh, um, about nuclear weapons and and that was in part because uh, the some of that footage that was there the black and white images that Lynn was uh, going through um, of the the book that the Habakkusha gave to her were you know we projected those on the wall of our living room and watched them over and over again. It was part of our education uh, as very young children, as young as Seamus and Madeline here. And um, that's Seamus, a very shy boy. Um, and, uh, and that is not the American education about nuclear weapons, uh, the education that I received, that my brother and sister received as, as small children. And, and I think at a, at a young age, we felt very responsible for nuclear weapons um, and responsible for their elimination. Um, and we were told that our mom and dad and all of our friends uh, went off to prison uh, because they were working so hard uh, to keep 
uh, those weapons from being used again. And, um, and they say that, that, uh, that fear is sort of a, you know, sort of triggering fear of uh, an event is not a good way to sort of engage people. This is what sociologists think, um, that, uh, that uh, kind of making people feel afraid uh, kind of causes people to retract to a more conservative position, right? Um, that's what I uh, learned in college. But, uh, but my fear of nuclear weapons, um, and my fear uh, of their use, my fear of their manufacture, my fear of the, the way in which the uh, uranium was pulled out uh, of the land, um, you know, kind of made me an activist, made, my, made me sort of accommodate to the fact that my parents went off to jail um, and that their friends uh, did that too. Um, and, uh, and I think that, well, I don't want my children to have nightmares about nuclear weapons. I also don't want them to kind of get to college or, or get to young adulthood and, and, and have this kind of weird, like, did all the adults in my life just lie to me and tell me that everything was going to be fine, mm -hmm. right? Oh, what, what is, what is this? What is this world that I am now responsible for? How could you do this to me? I uh, uh, can't countenance that. Um, and so, um, so I, you know, Steve Kelly's line there in the film about um, how we can't be fully human as long as these weapons continue to exist really we don't need to know what the acronyms stand for, right? We don't need to know the difference between a, a one weapon and the other, or a land-based or a sea-based, or the, you know, the, the kiloton yield of this one compared to that one, or a plutonium weapon versus a uranium weapon. We don't, we don't need to know any of that. It's handy sometimes, but, um, but what we need to know is that they have no right to exist, um, and that as long as they exist, we're we're kind of, we might look like full human beings, but we can't really be fully human, and we, we certainly can't be moral actors uh, in the world. Um, and this maybe has nothing to do with the, the question that you asked, but the, you know, it's striking to think about, you know, nuns and priests and, uh, and you know, Catholic religious um, being so much in the forefront of, of this particular movement, uh, the movement for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Ardeth and Carol, who are uh, in the film, are just tirelessly working. They're just churning along all the time. And I think every time we open up our newspapers and, and read about Catholic priests, we read about awful things uh, that they have done to, 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 to young people, right? Or we read about uh, the way in which Catholic Churches are closing schools and, and uh, um, uh, shutting down churches and, and uh, doing that over and against uh, the wishes of their congregations in their communities. Um, or we read about the way in which women are, are, are totally sidelined and, 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 and pushed, um, uh, you know, pushed out of leadership within the Catholic Church. And, and here we have this very different vision uh, and this very different lived reality of of Catholicism, and, and perhaps it's more of a, a small c uh, Catholicism, an early church uh, uh, sort of lived faith uh, of, of, of incredible personal responsibility um, and safeguarding a, a, of the next generation. Um, and uh, so anyway, I don't know. Uh, I think now it would be a good time to open questions to the audience. Before we do, I, I want to mention that uh, we are collecting donations f to support this film, and you should be able to find someone somewhere, if you haven't already, uh, who will offer you a, a button for a, a donation, and this is where the donations are going. Um, and I think maybe the best way, I'll consult with my colleagues in one way or another, um, to give questions is to hand this mic, and uh, and if it's a question for Alex, who's been deprived of a microphone, then um, he can he can share. Um, so, would anyone like to ask a question of our three panelists? I think maybe the most important thing that we can do is to really give people the honest.
facts about how these, this nuclear stuff is not making us safer. And I think that both Iran and North Korea are uh, interested in at least showing some signs of that they could have nuclear to keep us from, you know, uh, to, to deter us from attacking them. That is true. Um, I, I just also wanted to piggyback on something that was said about activism. Not everybody can, you know, cross into a nuclear base or do these kinds of protests. Let's let's be clear about that. But there are things that we can do. For example, there are a couple of initiatives right now. One is called Don't Bank on the Bomb, which um, has listed the organizations um, that invest heavily in nuclear weapons. I actually was very surprised to learn that Bank of America, where I had an account, is, is probably the biggest investor in nuclear weapons. Chase, Citibank, all of those, Goldman, uh, all of these companies invest heavily in nuclear weapons. And this new initiative, Don't Bank on the Bomb, is trying to emulate what, what happened with the um, South Africa uh, situation where uh, apartheid was eventually able to come to an end because people just stopped doing business with the, with the government. So that's one initiative. Uh, move the nuclear weapons money is another one. There are bills pending in Congress right now. Um, Ted, uh, Ted Lieu and uh, Ed Markey have sponsored a bill that would require uh, the president to get congressional approval before uh, launching a nuclear strike. So, um, you know, people can, can call their congresspeople and, and support certain bills. There's also an initiative to, for the United States to declare that it will do no, for, that it will not have a first strike policy. Right now, um, it does have, uh, it, 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 you typically hear uh, whenever there's any kind of um, brewing uh, issue that all options are on the table. And what that means is that we are willing to use nuclear weapons even against countries that don't have nuclear weapons. In fact, uh, President Trump's uh, uh, nuclear posture review said that it would be willing to use nuclear weapons even in the case of a computer type of hacking, a serious one. So um, the situation is escalating. Um, one of the new things that's happening also is that the U.S. government is creating a smaller nuclear weapon, the W76-2, which will be um, half of the um, power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And there's a tremendous amount of fear now that this will make it much more likely that we will use nuclear weapons. Um, I, you know, I don't mean to make this a depressing evening, but, but truthfully, there are many, many things that people, average, ordinary people can do um, on, on this. It's not just the activists. Yeah, I, I would add too, um, uh, people thinking of what, what can they do. Um, in terms of uh, when this topic comes up locally, I, I think General Dynamics and politicians who support General Dynamics have like a real monopoly on the public conversation. Mm -hmm. So whenever um, there's a story that comes out, the articles that you read in the Promise Journal or elsewhere, or the stories you'll see on TV, um, they just contain quotes from the company officials and then quotes from the um, you know, governor or senators or whoever it is that's um, supporting them. And I, I think it's um, dangerous and concerning when all officials are on the same page, because um, then anyone covering them is just quoting people who all agree and you're not getting like alternative viewpoints in there um, that, that um, should be included. So I, I would just tell people to try to get their, um, if they feel differently, to try to get their voice out there. You know, write a letter to the editor if you read a, an article that you think is um, one-sided like they often are on this subject. Any more questions? Um, I don't know about Rhode Island. Uh, but uh, there was a group of us, and I think a couple of people came down from Rhode Island. There you are. Hi. Um, at uh, the latest uh, commissioning of a submarine, it was the USS South Dakota, um, and there were probably 35 of us, maybe 40 of us, um, out there uh, that morning. It was bitterly cold. 
The next time we'll be at the sub-base in Groton is on Good Friday. Good Friday. Uh, we do the Stations of the Cross there. Each Good Friday, I think it starts at 10 o'clock. And I, I don't have, like a good Catholic guy, I don't know when exactly Good Friday Sometime is. Sometime in April. Sometime in April. <laughs> um, and so uh, folks are, are, are welcome to come out uh, for that. Um, and then there is a, a weekly peace vigil in downtown New London uh, that's organized by St. Francis House and a local Veterans for Peace chapter. And you could uh, find out exactly when that is and uh, about inclement weather. I know it's a, a little ways uh, for folks here, uh, but by going to the St. Francis House website, Saint which Francis. is pretty easy to find, St. Francis House, New London. Um, and uh, like many local peace movements, Rhode Island's is um, s somewhat um, somewhat uh, decentralized, and it's sometimes difficult to connect and to different groups and figure out what's going on. Um, one of the things that we've done recently is to have a meeting with numerous groups and to create a public calendar, mm -hmm. and. We'll have this on our website, and other groups will have this on our website, and hopefully what it will be able to do is um, inform anybody in Rhode Island or anyone anywhere of the action of various peace actions, either plowshare actions or other types of vigils or events indeed like this going on in Rhode Island. Now, um, so you should speak with, uh, you can speak with me or find stuff on our various internet and uh, presence is to learn more about that as well. And, and then I was offered by the government assurance of, uh, uh, and the comfort of the concept of mutually assured destruction, although I'm protected, uh, because they'll never use theirs. Because if, you know, if they fire one, we'll fire one. I, I want to hearken back to something that Frida said. I think that people have just um, concluded that this is the purview of the experts, that this is above my pay grade, you know, that someone else is taking care of it and it's going to be all okay. And, and uh, not only the purview of the experts, but of the activists. Um, Hans Christensen, whom you saw in the film, the head of the uh, Nuclear Information Project, told that for the, the average person is just not involved in this. It has become, you know, the area of just experts and activists. And, 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 th and this is the problem. Remember in the 1980s when you had uh, the largest uh, demonstration in Central Park, more than one million people. That was, uh, there was concern that, you know, Reagan and would, the, that there would be a nuclear war. We don't have that. And so, I think you're right. I think the only way that there will be change, it has to come from the bottom up. You know, I agree with you. Um, there's too much money involved in nuclear weapons. Um, it, is, it is, according to the book that uh, was written by Dan Zak, who did an actual uh, examination of this incident at Y12, he says that nuclear weapons funding is the third largest expenditure by the federal government after non-nuclear defense spending and social security. So there's a tremendous amount of money being made. There are nuclear weapons facilities in practically every state of the country and people's jobs are, um, you know, people's jobs are involved. When we did, when we were shooting out on the west coast at the Bangor Naval Base, you know, there would be people watching the shoot and they would say, look, you know, we don't really want to be involved in making nuclear weapons, but we need health care, you know, we need to put food on the table for our children. And so this is the this is what the deal that we've cut for ourselves. It's it's quite an insidious problem. Um, and again, you know, I do feel that as we sh showed in the film that um, th there was a a fellow from Germany who was with the International Association of Attorneys saying that, you know, we have to occupy the streets again. Um, and I, I, I shudder to think that there would have to be some kind of horrific crisis, you know, for that to happen. But, um, you know, in, in uh, I don't know how many of you have read the Dan Ellsberg book, The uh, Doomsday Machine, but, you know, according to him, he was a nuclear a war planner during the 60s, and he said that the nuclear war plans are very much the same. They haven't changed, and, and large cities are being held at risk. 
You know, we, we are all basically 15 minutes away from um, if Trump got a message that, you know, nuclear weapons were heading here from Russia, he would have at most something like 15 minutes to decide whether to launch our own or, or our missiles would be destroyed in their silos by the Russians. So, you know, it's just the information is just not out there. And the, 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 biggest, the biggest challenge, I think, in this entire um, problem, for want of a better word, is lack of, inf lack of awareness on the part of the public. The young people are very engaged in the um, climate change movement. And as, um, you know, there, there have been studies by climate scientists that say if even a quote-unquote small nuclear war were to take place, let's say, between India and Pakistan, with each country only using 50 nuclear weapons, a tiny fraction of what we have in the world, it would create a mini uh, ice age uh, in this hemisphere. There would be so much smoke and soot that would be lofted into the atmosphere. It would travel to our hemisphere, essentially blocking the sun and creating a problem with growing food. So um, again, it's back to information, and um, it's just not it's just not getting out there for whatever reason. I think you're doing 90 percent of the work of of informing people. Uh, we can stay in denial about this, and then I think the rest of the American people can stay in denial about this for a long time, and, and the, but what you're doing is very valuable. Um, and I have kind of a simple, uh, maybe narrow question, probably for Frida would be the best to, to ask this to. Uh, how are the lawyers doing with coming up with more effective defenses for people like your mom and for the the other thing. One of the things that struck me in the film was the, the notion of criminal intent. I'm not a lawyer, but I always kind of like, oh, wow. you know, I like these little arguments that no one could make the argument that they were trying to steal nuclear weapons or they were trying to sabotage nuclear weapons or and they were, they were just trying to call attention to the fact. And, and, and so they didn't have any criminal intent. Criminal intent is an important thing in our legal system. So what, how are the lawyers doing in coming up with better arguments for that? Or do you know anything? Can you comment about that? Uh, yes. Uh, I am also not a lawyer. Uh, and having uh, spent a lot of time uh, in uh, courtrooms as a kid, I, I, I tend to sort of shut off a little bit. But, but I think this, uh, this new legal strategy that I mentioned about uh, uh, religious freedom uh, I don't think it'll go anywhere, uh, but it, um, it wasn't before a jury when they made these uh, motions, uh, but they were able to speak uh, very broadly and very autobiographically about their motivation, the information that they learned that led them to this, the way in which uh, each of them individually and them, then them as a community had exhausted all legal means. They have met with their congressmen. They have, and congresswomen, they have written letters to the editor. They have protested um, uh, legally. They have educated themselves. They've done everything else and then uh, felt like this was um, an action of last resort to, um, to keep a larger harm from uh, being perpetrated. Um, and so they were, you know, under this legal rubric, they were able to, to speak very broadly. And, and one of the difficulties recently has been all of that, as you heard Michael Wally say, all of it is inadmissible, all of it. Um, it, it it's very narrowly focused on, on what was done. And even when you, um, what's the word, when uh, defendants uh, stipulate to the facts, we did, you know, we did cut that fence, we did enter that uh, a door left ajar, we did carry this hammer, we did carry this blood. Um, even when you stipulate to the facts, the jury, um, uh, in, in most uh, plowshares cases, has not been able to hear uh, about uh, people's motivation and, and about the larger harm. Um, and uh, and uh, people continue to sort of carry out these witnesses, really hoping to um, to connect with the jurors. and. And even the jurors who found uh, the defendants not guilty in, um, out in Washington were very moved and troubled and 
um, and uh, hopefully motivated to educate themselves further about nuclear weapons as they kind of develop these kind of mini relationships uh, with, with the defendants, as you saw uh, the man, uh, the, def uh, the juror going uh, to the uh, ground zero community after the action. Um, and so, uh, but um, our legal system is based on precedent and the, the you know, in an early, I, I think it was 87 or 88, maybe 89, uh, there was a case uh, that um, really laid out the necessity defense and, and the way in which, um, you know, the defendants were able to talk all about nuclear weapons and all about uh, international law, um, which should supersede uh, U.S. law and be sort of larger than U.S. law. And, and because uh, they were, you know, uh, the, the judgment came down against all of that, well then, you know, prosecutors today really just have to kind of cite that case and, and, and the judges just sort of move it all along. Um, and then I think uh, defendants have other tools at their disposal, right? Uh, my father and Steve Kelly and Mark Koval and, um, and Susan Crane uh, all just at one point turned their backs uh, on the judges uh, and, and, the, and the jurors and the prosecution in Maine um, at a plowshares action and just said, we, so we will be silent, we will be silent. And uh, uh, they were taken out of the courtroom, they refused to come back into the court the next day. Um, and so uh, they, were, uh, they were found guilty, there were empty chairs uh, there instead of uh, the defendants themselves. And so, you know, when you're not trying to win, right, as, as they were obviously not trying to do, um, when you're not trying to win, uh, perhaps a, a new kind of space that isn't quite, you know, it isn't recognized as, as law kind of opens up. Um, and uh, the kind of peaceful anarchy that all of us, you know, desire deeply in our hearts, or I certainly desire in my heart, um, is able to sort of like peek out uh, because uh, people aren't afraid of the consequences. The worst that can happen um, is that they're, they're sentenced to years and years in prison, right? That's the, that's the worst at this point. They've already stepped into these free fire zones. They've already sort of in a sense, been resurrected, right? They've continued to live despite entering these hearts of darkness. Um, and so each of them finds themselves really free and unencumbered by fear of consequence. Um, and that's a, that's a very powerful place to be. Um, it's, a, it's a terrifying place uh, to be uh, to be loving somebody who's in that place, right? Uh, but it's a, it's a very powerful place to be. Um, and so, and so that is some of the magic, some of the alchemy um, of, 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 of plowshares um, and, uh, and some of the grace uh, that's there too. Uh, to the question about um, making young people care about the subject, I've, I've noticed in writing about this and talking to people about this subject, um, sometimes the angle of corporate greed resonates with young people more than anything. And um, I mean, this is, I think this is a story of corporate greed and um, just looking at the, the kind of the financial side of this and, and how much these companies make and how much money they spend on stock repurchases and, and all of that. Um, and then also with young people, I mean, the, the idea that, you know, we're saying we're going to spend a trillion dollars modernizing um, our nuclear triad when people want money dedicated to so many other areas. I think that that resonates with them too. Um, so I think it might be framing maybe the, the peace movement in a new way for people um, that resonates with what young people are interested in today. I, I just wanted to also say, you know, a couple of very po kind of positive things that are happening. I think that, you know, it, young people in other countries are very engaged in this, especially in Scandinavia. Um, I know that, for example, um, with this new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, it is gaining momentum, having the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons winning the Nobel Peace Prize was quite 
you know, a big boost to that now that there are 70 countries that have signed the treaty, 122 adopted it, 70 have signed it, 20 have ratified it, or 21, and once 50 countries ratify it, nuclear weapons will be deemed illegal under international law. And so the strategy is that nuclear weapons will be stigmatized in the world, and they will be in the same category as biological and chemical weapons. And the United States and the other nuclear-armed uh, countries are very nervous about this, you know, putting a lot of pressure on small countries not to sign this treaty. And I do see that as a very positive move uh, on this. The other thing that's very positive is that um, there's a lot of momentum in Hollywood to create uh, dramatic stories to actually bring this issue to the public. Um, there's a series now that's going to be debuting, I think it's on Showtime, about Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And um, I was personally at a meeting at the Writers Guild where they brought in a whole group of people from Hollywood to strategize on what kind of stories can we you know, get out there to get people in engaged in this. So th there are positive things happening, too. I, I think the word that comes to mind is responsibility and, um, and not... Um, subcontracting one's personal responsibility to politicians or to corporations or to, to experts um, and, uh, and really building community. Um, and you know, this, this film is in Washington and, and uh, Tennessee and New York City and lots of places in between. And um, you, know, you, keep seeing, uh, uh, you keep seeing the same people um, and, uh, and because this is a community, this is a family, um, and each action seeds the next action, right? Megan saw her friends, uh, you know, step out into the wilderness and, um, and come through that, and she said, I want to be part of the next action. Come see me if you want to be part of the next action. And, and uh, Steve Kelly said that too, and, 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 and there he is in, in jail in Georgia. And so, um, you know, and, and not every one of us is, is going to do that action, but we can uh, show up for one another, we can be part of that larger community, we can sort of um, have a piece of that uh, responsibility, uh, that personal responsibility for, you know, the thing that is so impersonal, so indiscriminately evil, so killing of, of everything and killing even though it's not going off, right? One of the, the points that the Kings Bay Plowshares makes in, in their statement is that uh, nuclear weapons are being detonated every single day in every sort of utterance uh, of, our, uh, of our president and, and not just uh, this one, but each uh, American president is, is able to operate with total impunity because they have their hands on the nuclear switch. Um, and uh, it, it, it permeates every aspect of our economy, it permeates our culture, it permeates how, how many of our children are taught to resolve conflicts and, and, and treat one another, right? Like we, um, we all have a little bit of the bomb in us and, and how, do we, how do we get that out of us? How do we sort of um, purge ourselves of that? And we do that by, um, by connecting with one another and being responsible for one another and, and building the kind of community that, uh, that we hope, that we hope um, will, will eventually render these uh, weapons impotent and obsolete, right? Uh, that's what Reagan wanted to do by, uh, by making Star Wars, right? Uh, I wanna render these weapons impotent and obsolete. Well, um, well Star Wars hasn't done it and uh, mutually assured destruction hasn't done it and, and uh, despite the best efforts of the international community, the, uh, the kind of architecture of, of, of treaties and uh, agreements hasn't done it yet either and I think it is our as the birthplace of the bomb, it really is our responsibility as Americans to, um, to do it. Um, and uh, and it, it kind of, it starts with our, our regard for one another and our respect for the humanity of each person. And, um, and, and for many of the people in the film, that comes out of a, of, of a religious um, uh, wellspring, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to come out of Catholicism or, 
or, or Quakerism or, or whatever, it can just come out of that ethos of, of, of humanity and respect for life. And with that, why don't we give one more round of applause to our panelists and also round of applause for the wonderful film.